Uh, thank you, Amal, for your very kind introduction. That was a terrible giveaway, I'm afraid, because we had to, you know, all the slides were revealed. But anyway, you would have understood that it's going to be a bit of a long wait for you today until the raffle and the lunch comes. So I apologize in advance. But um, really speaking, uh, I've been here for three months, here at Martele. But really speaking, again, I have been here for a longer time because it was in this hospital that I saw the light of day many years ago. I hope you won't ask me how long ago. <coughs> so being a true kettle of the soil, uh, it's really my pleasure to be talking to you today. And I hope uh, the topic that I've selected would be of some help to you. So what does it really mean to save your skin? It literally means um, getting out of a difficult situation. So I hope uh, the little tips that I'm going to give you today would help you do just that. Uh, nowadays, uh, people tend to look at dermatologists as uh, if they are witches who can do wonders, you know, on their broomstick. With um, people come and ask us to do to make them beautiful, to make them fairer, um, and they are generally termed the witches of itch because that's our main bread and butter. So some of these things are practical, some of them aren't, because in the real world situation, in a tropical country uh, uh, such as us, um, the scenario or the environment is different, and it leads to uh, can lead to so many diseases of the skin, more than 3,000 basically. So um, some of which um, need to be um, looked into. So uh, the field of dermatology is a fast developing one. So gone are the days where all our colleagues used to say, hey, you've got just five diseases and five tubes of cream. <coughs> so you apply anything and the disease is gone. So um, we basically do a lot of general dermatology, uh, dealing with uh, skin conditions like eczema, psoriasis, black and plainness, and you know, other papillosquamous disorders, and all sorts of skin infections, uh, particularly uh, the um, uh, things like cutaneous leishmaniasis and leprosy, mm -hmm. then we deal with autoimmune conditions, immunology and drug reactions, neoplastic and malignant disease, and the uh, list goes on and on. And then we uh, have a big part of medical dermatology, the autoimmune mm -hmm. disorders, the lupus spectrum for example, where we have a part to play, then pediatric dermatology, and then dermatosurgery where we take off uh, small lumps and bumps and do corrective surgery as well sometimes and then uh, dermatopathology. Uh, procedural dermatology is coming up in uh, a big way. We do things like phototherapy, uh, electrosurgery for different cosmetic procedures, cryotherapy, iontophoresis, etc., to name a few. And all these are available in our hospital. Uh, but uh, people seem to have, uh, seem to play a lot of attention to uh, the upcoming uh, area of aesthetic dermatology, where dermatologists are basically seen as specialists dealing with skin, hair, and nail problems. Uh, and uh, we, for in this arena, we do lots of lasers, we do things like chemical peeling, PRP, acne scar revision procedures, Botox, fillers, body contouring, etc. So, since the world is going in a different way, and most attention is, uh, you know, focused on on this bit. Probably you are well aware of this arena. I think we should be uh, looking at everything on the whole and not lose our balance. Because uh, I'm targeting this talk mainly for the uh, general practitioners. I mean, it's difficult to choose a topic where the uh, audience is so variable. But uh, in your day-to-day -day practice, you will be coming across a lot of problems. So I hope to give you a few tips on um, how to deal with them. So do matters of the skin really matter? Yes, skin matters. Why? Because in your practice you know that uh, dermatological problems actually comprise nearly one third the workload of a general practitioner who are encountered with so many skin problems because everybody has a skin problem at any time. And um, unfortunately, a medical undergraduate learns dermatology for only two weeks during his entire career. So there's a big gap in the knowledge, uh, the, the demand for uh, your work uh, from what you can gather from these two weeks. So let's learn a bit of dermatology and try to save our skins. 
Okay, I'll do, like to do this as a case presentation basically. So this is my first case. So this is a young woman. And you know that women like to look beautiful and have clear skin. A young woman with previously clear skin presenting with an outbreak of spots in the lower part of the face for the past one year. She's been really struggling with this, trying different products, but it doesn't seem to go away. This seems to have set in with the COVID pandemic. And as you know, um, uh, acne is a, is a common, it's a very common problem, especially among teenagers, but not necessarily so during the recent years, because even older people, if, even people in their 50s, uh, are seen to come up with outbreaks of acne. And this particular case that I'm talking about, you get the breakout around the mouth, the nose, and the chin area uh, under the face mask, basically. And uh, this particular condition is called maskne, which might be a new term for you. It actually exists. So why do you get pimples underneath your uh, mask? It's mainly uh, due to occlusion, you know, skin irritation caused by the sweat, the dirt, the heat, and the moisture that comes out from your, from your breath. This generates acne. So it's not only uh, the acne that comes up, but also seborrheic dermatitis, uh, rosacea, and even pityriasis versiclor. Common conditions can occur, even vitiligo, is seen to occur underneath the mask area. So, um, yeah. so what sort of thing could you do about this? You have to select the right mask and uh, wear the mask in the proper way. So um, most of us wear K95 masks or the surgical disposable surgical masks which can actually cause a bit of skin irritation. So if you have a problem like this, it's generally advised to switch to uh, silk masks or cloth-based masks which absorb the skin secretions and you can wash them away. So, uh, and it's also advised to take mask breaks frequently if possible, go to a safe place and take off your mask and give time for your skin to breathe and you can use non-comedogenic skin products and uh, things like topical benzoyl peroxide or retinoids may be necessary depending on the degree of, of uh, the acne that you have, even oral antibiotics. Okay, this is my uh, second patient, this lovely boy who is four years old uh, presented with this um, angry looking boggy lump on the vertex of the scalp for two weeks duration. Uh, the parents were very worried because um, this was studded with pustules and basically oozing with pus and there were uh, prominent cervical lymphadenopathy, cervical lymph nodes present. So what is your diagnosis and what would you do in this situation? It's an abscess, so do N, I and D immediately. It's an abscess, you treat with oral antibiotics and C. It's a fungus, you give topical mechanism. It's a parunkal on the scalp, so you admit for IV antibiotics. You do not know really, so let's give a triple combination cream, which is the common thing to do. Three in one, the cure for all ills. So what would you actually do? What is this condition? Yep, it's actually a kirion. A kirion is actually um, an inflammatory fungal infection of the scalp. Tinea capitis. Uh, we like we dermatologists like to use fancy words, by the way. So um, the um, the inflammation is so intense that it leads to pus formation and a boggy mass. But what will happen if you incise this? This may be against the surgical principles, but if you uh, incise the kirion, it can lead to scarring, which may be permanent. So the child can end up with a bald patch on the vertex of the scalp. So it's not advised at all to do an IND, but we treat them with oral antifungals uh, such as Grisio pulvin, itraconazole or terbinafin uh, for three to six weeks for prolonged periods. And it can completely settle with this treatment. We also combine with topical, uh, uh, topical antifungals and shampoos. Okay, let's go to case number three. Uh, this was... Uh, a 20-year-old, previously healthy university student, a girl from Dambulla area, who presented with these um, painful skin lesions of three days duration on the um, 
dorsal aspect of the of the hands and the arms as well. But she was a very fair individual, and the lower part of the skin is actually her, her, her usual skin color. And you can see uh, these necrotic areas coming up and starting to peel off. It was bilateral, and you see this flattened appearance. She was very worried. Uh, she, because, you know why? Because she had her exams coming up and she was in the frequent habit of studying at home because she was given study leave. The house was in Dambulla and there was an adjoining large paddy field. So she would uh, study deep into the night and sometimes she would even sleep uh, unintentionally over her desk. So what is your diagnosis? Is it something like acute lupus? Is it necrotizing fasciitis? Could it be irritant contact dermatitis? But what could irritate the skin like this? Is it a dermatitis artifactor, self-inflicted due to maybe a mental strain? Or is it staphylococcus called a skin syndrome? The answer is very simple. It's actually irritant contact dermatitis. This is what we call Pideros dermatitis or Mr. Beetle dermatitis. It's actually caused by these uh, little insects, sometimes that we call worm massa. They come and swarm around the lights and then they fall and die. And most of them contain things like cantharidines, which are necrotic to the skin. So like if they land on your skin and you uh, just slap them away, and the juice comes out, it can cause skin necrosis. This is very common here in Martha. I have seen many cases in children. I'm not aware of which uh, beetle exactly, but uh, they can cause what you call kissing lesions because at night they come in and land in a place like this. So uh, it gets crushed and you get a necrotic patch the, uh, early the next morning and it has a symmetrical appearance. So that's the clue for pederast dermatitis. Um, let's move on to case four. And, uh, are you with me or am I too fast or like you feel it bored? No. I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. This is probably for the surgeons as well. So uh, this person uh, was a 45 year old school teacher uh, who presented with uh, recurrent episodes of pain and swelling of the right foot for three years. It's basically the lower part of the leg as well. He had been uh, going through several courses of IV antibiotics with hospitalization, but they simply would not settle completely and would repeat. He had diabetes, so he attributed this to his diabetes, as there was a numbness also over the foot with a history of foot drop, which was previously undetected. The problem is in, in the right leg, basically. So um, what's your diagnosis? Would you consider chronic lymphedema? Uh, there was non-pitting edema, basically. <coughs> or could it be venous stasis eczema with a recurrent cellulitis for which he had been treated? Uh, could it be deep vein thrombosis? And now something quite silly. Could it be cutaneous leishmaniasis or could it be a leprosy reaction? So uh, the little clues here are to look for the skin surface changes. Uh, is there any eczema there or are there any patches? And you have to ask about the numbness as well and the foot drop. So sometimes looking at the bigger picture can really save your skin. I'm not going to give you the answer now. I'll leave it for a while and I'm going to show you my next case. From here onwards, I'm going to lose my number of cases, so I'm just going to show uh, clinical pictures. This boy was uh, from uh, Polonaru, where I did my first appointment. What do you notice here? There's a thick structure there. Uh, it was quite palpable, and you could roll it from side to side. It was firm. Um, and if you look at the area just behind the other retro auricular area, there's a little patch there. I wonder if you can notice it. So if you take a little uh, a toothpick and just uh, check the sensation, uh, it's not there. It's, it's a 
patch where there is no sensation, and that's the uh, greater auricular nerve that's that's really thickened. Here is a similar man. This one was from Anuradhapura. I, I keep seeing lots of these people. So what is the diagnosis here? I know that you will jump and say leprosy because there's a, a, a patch with sensory loss and a thickened nerve. Okay, and this one was from uh, NHSL as a trainee, but I've seen lots of people like this afterwards, but I didn't bother to take pictures because there are so plenty. So this, uh, these were other legs of an uh, old man. He was, I think, about 75 years old, ulcerated, and of course, neuropathic feet from a distance. There was edema as well. And that was his face. So what do you see on the face? The most noteworthy thing is that the nose, which looks quite bulbous and infiltrated, and look at the lips. He's got um, nodules right round, and if you have a look at the lateral view, you see nodules on the ear as well. So what's the diagnosis here? Again, I'm sure you would say leprosy. Have you seen any leprosy cases here in your practice? I, well, maybe you have, but maybe you didn't recognize. And this again uh, is a man with a similar appearance. They all seem to be brothers, don't they, with the bulbous nose, the uh, infiltrated um, brow area, and the cheeks as well. His lips are not infiltrated. And this was his back, basically. What do, what do you see there? There are lesions of, a, of a, a, a particular nature, the center one where there seems to be a sort of hole and then um, Right round, you see an infiltration is known, known as an uh, inverted saucer uh, plaque. So what is the diagnosis here? Again, it's a different form of leprosy. So leprosy is a, a, a disease with a lot of taboo. So people used to believe that if you have leprosy, your fingers and your toes will fall off so, and uh, your limbs will get shorter by the day. It's true that your limbs can get shorter by the day and your digits, that's due to neuropathy and ulceration, but it really doesn't happen this way. A uh, little bit about leprosy. So what is it? It's a, it's a chronic infection of the skin and the nerves, and it's caused by uh, the intracellular mycobacterium, mycobacterium leprae. And how do you get leprosy? It's mainly thought to be due to, uh, to, be due to droplet infections, but but like if I sit with a leprosy patient, would I just simply get leprosy? No, I wouldn't. Because if we take the general population, if we take all of you, I mean 10 of you, uh, 9 will have innate immunity against leprosy. So you won't catch it just like that. But one person will be susceptible. So it's, um, it isn't spread by you know, touching or contact through skin. And the disease has a very long incubation period, sometimes going up to 5, 15 years. 5 to 15 years after the first exposure. So as I said, it's associated with uh, a lot of stigma in our society, mainly due to disability. By disability, what I mean is the, the neuropathy that you get and then uh, the, the loss of functions of your limbs. Uh, you get um, ulnar palsies, you get food drops, uh, different things, and ulceration and unsightly uh, deformities. So uh, the neuropathy can be prevented if uh, if we detect this early, and so it's really necessary to diagnose patients and treat them to prevent permanent sequelae. So how do you diagnose leprosy? The first thing is, if there's a hypopigmented or skin-colored patch anywhere on the body uh, that has a definitive sensory impairment, then you have to think of leprosy. So if there's something where you're not sure whether the, uh, whether the, um, um, the, the, uh, the sensation is there or not, but there is a thickened nerve in the vicinity, then you have to think of leprosy. The other thing is the demonstration of acid fast bacilli in a lesion by doing a slit skin smear. So how do you check for sensation? You don't always have to have a, a toothpick. So if you take the normal uh, OPD chit, you fold it in two and fold it again so that it makes a point and you can check the sensation with that. So studies have shown that that is comparable to, to gold standard testing for sensation. So I've shown you different pictures of leprosy and you understand that it's actually a clinical spectrum that you see. So you have tuberculoid leprosy on one end where you get 
just uh, one or two patches like in the neck of the men that I showed. On the other hand, you get lepromatous leprosy where, you, where the um, bacterial count is very, very high and this is the type that's really contagious. All those people that I showed you that looked like brothers with the face uh, in facial infiltration. I'll skip some of these slides, but you know, leprosy is also, uh, uh, the differentiation is based on the immunological responses that you get. Uh, the, between the tuberculoid uh, lepromatous and the borderline types in between, which are the unstable variants. So these are examples of tuberculoid leprosy. So if you see patches like this, then please do think of what I said. I'm showing you all these pictures because in dermatology, it's the photographic memory that memory that really plays a big part in our lives. We remember pictures, we remember people's faces, and then you match that with another picture, and then the diagnosis clicks. So it may, sound, uh, may not sound very scientific, but I think it applies to everyone. So uh, if you remember um, some of these pictures, you might feel like um, thinking whether it's leprosy. Uh, these are the superficial uh, nerves that we normally palpate, these with palpable sites. Then again, you see the greater auricular nerve uh, enlarged. And what is that thing on the arm? The radiologists might have an idea. They might do an ultrasound and tell me that it's an abscess, but where is this abscess coming from? It's coming from the ulna nerve. So doing an IND is not going to help very much in this situation. So if the nerve is thickened and you get an abscess, then you have to think of a type 1 uh, lepra reaction, which I will talk about in a little while. Now these are the borderline ones, the unstable ones, which can, you know, um, um, have very, very different clinical presentations. I'm sure our rheumatologists will agree. They might even look like lupus and mislead you totally. And then, of course, our lion-like men with the leonine faces, they are the brothers that I'm talking to you about. So it, it isn't uh, difficult to spot them. So the idea is to catch it early. So you need a high degree of clinical suspicion and there's a definitive treatment available which can cure leprosy completely. I won't go through these details, but we normally treat them for 6 to 12 months. And then we'll talk a little about, a bit about the complications of pregnancy, which are the dreaded ones that we need to uh, prevent. So yeah, uh, there is something for the, um, for, uh, for the eye specialist as well. And uh, you know, it can lead to uh, blindness and then uh, you know the uh, variable, the, the various uh, palsies, the nerve palsies that may not be reversible once it progresses to this rate, this uh, level. And then uh, you might have a very vague memory from your from your medical school days about lepra reactions, that lecture that we slept through. Yes, there are basically and and never understood. These are immunological <coughs> reactions caused by uh, the leprosy bacillus and the response of the body, the, the immunological reaction the body uh, hosts against uh, uh, the leprosy bacillus. There are basically two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is the catchy one because it's also known as an ENL or an erythema nodosum leprosum. It gives rise to nodes. But this is what you see in type 1. These patients could easily present to your medical casualty or your surgical casualty. They get a uh, high-grade fever, they get swelling of the limbs, which could be mistaken for cellulitis, and uh, new onset uh, nerve palsies. There are lots of features of type 1 reactions. Um, and this is a type 2 reaction, basically. So you can see the nodules that come up anew. They may not be on existing patches, and they can also mimic lots of very common medical and surgical conditions. So coming back to that, uh, to my uh, uh, teacher that I was talking about, I know that you will know the answer. Now, he actually has a huge patch on his uh, right foot extending uh, to the mid part of the shin, which is sort of uh, dry, idiomatous. So this was actually a recurrent type 1 lepra reaction that he had. His leprosy was previously undiagnosed. He responded very well to treatment, uh, which we had to continue for 12 months. And uh, lepra reactions are treated with uh, topical, uh, with, uh, with uh, oral steroids for prolonged periods of time. 
And this grandmother I found in Polar Narva. She was so pretty. She was, uh, I think, 75 years old. But there wasn't a single wrinkle on the face. So everybody wanted to know, including her daughters, what is your secret? Um, so she would probably say that she's, ve she's been vegetarian all her life. And she was attributing this to that. Somehow or the other, she was brought to the dermatology clinic, not, of course, to reveal the, uh, her skin uh, secrets, but because her limbs were changing shape, and looking at the matters. So normally when you look at a face, you expect the limbs to go, uh, you know, in line with the face. But look at the hands and the feet. What do you see there? There were several neuropathic ulcers on the hands and the legs were itty matters. And look at the ear. It actually, uh, there were several nodules there. So this grandmother actually had a huge patch of tubercular leprosy on the face. You know, it infiltrates the skin. So if something infiltrates your skin, it, it uh, basically irons out all your, all your wrinkles. <laughs> and so this is actually called pretty leprosy, bon le leprosy. Um, there's a South African variant where this is very common. It's not found in Sri Lanka, but I think this was just a coincidental finding. So if your face looks too pretty and doesn't go along, <laughs> along with your limbs, then you have to think of what I said. This is not very uncommon, you see. This is another woman that I found uh, in Anuradhapura. Very pretty face, rosy cheeks. Oh, you turn to the side and you see the problem there. She too had a huge patch of tubercular leprosy on the face. Can you see the margin? Mm -hmm. I'm very thankful to this protector because it gives um, crystal clear her <laughs> pictures. I'm very happy about it. Okay, we're talking about hyperpigmented patches on the face. Now, what do you think of this one? Leprosy? I think I probably made you biased. This is not leprosy. This is photodermatitis of the face. Uh, don't ask me why I say that. There are subtle features, basically. So like the lesions on the forehead, they have this sort of hyperpigmented center uh, with the um, surrounding hypopigmentation. That's a clue. And what can this be? This is leprosy. That's a typical appearance. There was an inverted saucer the ones that I showed you with the borderline leprosy and with treatment it settled. So when the when the surrounding ring goes down, that's what it looks like. And doesn't that look like borderline leprosy? It does. But this is actually granuloma annulare. And what's wrong with this girl? She has a hypopigmented patch on the face. But it's not exactly a patch. You see, the sites are slightly infiltrated, and if you touch, it's palpable. So what do you think this could be? Would you consider tuberculoid leprosy in this case? Please say yes, because it is. And she was actually uh, the granddaughter of the grandmother that I showed you. So this thing is called a saucer, a campus lesion. That's due to kissing, you know, the lips were infiltrated in the older woman. She would hug the child and so that could transmit. But don't go away with the idea that every time somebody kisses you, you would get leprosy. It doesn't happen like that. But, you know, there's a genetic susceptibility as well. So, uh, like, the, in the same family, you can share the same susceptibility genes. Now, what about this? This little one, there's the... Um, central hyperpigmentation and the surrounding hypopigmentation that I talked to you about? Yeah, so what do you think this is? A photodermatitis, okay? And this boy? I won't keep you guessing. That's with rises versus no. At this magnification, it's not possible to see, but you have to have a very close look, and I'm sure all of you can identify a pit rises. Okay, so the key things are, when you see a hypopigmented patch, Always test for sensory impairment. You look for thicker nerves. It can just take a few seconds, uh, which could be local, which could be not. Does this go away? Where's the mouse, please? Uh, oh, it goes away. Okay, thanks. Then you have to ask for peripheral numbness. Uh, you know, it's <coughs> numbness peripherally, and you have to assess for nerve function impairment in a very quick way. Okay. All right. Uh, this is another uh, schoolboy. You know, I'm I'm trying to mislead you today. So doesn't this look like uh, the previous people that I showed you? 
what's the thing in common? There is a hyperpigmented patch, but it's quite large, but there is no obvious nerve enlargement here. Uh, the clue is in the border here. The border is quite active, and there's a fine scale, and this is very itchy. So, what is this condition? It's tinea corporis. So, tinea corporis or dermatophyte infections, you also call them ringworm, uh, they, infect the, they can infect the skin, hair, and nails. So, I, I told you that we like to use fancy names. So, there are lots of tongue twisting names like tinea corporis, tinea cruris, fascia, pedis, whatever. So, it all means the same thing. It's just an infection. It's what, what differs is the place where it is. So how do we diagnose them? It's basically a clinical diagnosis, but we can um, confirm through scrapings for microscopy and sometimes culture. Uh, how do you treat this uh, tinea corporis? Antifungals. Now here I must tell you that nowadays we are seeing an epidemic of dermatophyte infections. Almost everybody has them. If I see 10 patients in my clinic, at least three or four of them would have this, even as an incidental finding. Why is this? I'll tell you in a minute. So the thing is, we need to know how to treat them, treat them properly. So um, look at this uh, lady. She also had a very itchy patch, but it does not look exactly like the previous one, right? Would you think of tinea corporis here or tinea fasciae? You might have to consider. And look at this woman again. She has sort of two lines there very itchy again, but there are papules, and this one too, it looks a bit like a leprosy patch as well. All these people have tinea infections, but what is wrong with them? They're so extensive, they can, you know, go all over your body, but the flu is in the periphery where you see lots of satellite lesions. This could easily, um, like, you know, you could think of erythroderma or some other condition, but this again is a tinea infection. And you call this tinea incognita. Incognita means hidden. So why is the tinea hidden? That's because of the treatment that we give. We, in the sense, well, we all give. So that's because we are very fond of using steroids for everything. You know, the 3 in 1 cream that I was talking about? Yeah? So. When you, what happens when you apply a topical steroid on your uh, skin uh, fungal infection? So itch or pruritus is a <coughs> defensive mechanism. When it itches, we know that there's a problem there, and itch comes up because of the inflammation. And when there's inflammation, that again tells us that there's defense going on within the skin against the, uh, uh, the noxious stimulus. When you apply a steroid, it just kills off the inflammation. And what does the fungus do? It grows happily and beautifully and then comes off with a wider rim. That's what happens when you do that. So that again is a tinea incognita. And the, this lady on the left, it was all red and sore. And when you take off the steroid component, the tinea actually emerges in its true uh, appearance. So um, topical steroids do mask infections. And a three-in-one cream is not a cure for all ills. So please don't believe in this sort of thing because they all contain this three-in-one business. But I must give you, uh, utilize this time to talk a little bit about the uh, topical steroid ladder. Are you aware of something like this, a ladder, a step ladder where you can escalate on topical steroids? Yes, there are, you know, the baby ones and the very potent ones. So clobetasol is one, is the most um, potent mm -hmm. A topical steroid that we have. So this is what you find in your Enderm GM that you use for all, you know, the three in one. So you have to use it very, very sparingly. In Europe and I hope in Australia too, it's only the dermatologists who are, you know, allowed to use clobetasol. But here you can buy it over the counter from any pharmacy, and they prescribe this for antifungal for, for fungal infections. Then your hydrocortisone is is baby strength. And the beta methasone is also potent, but you know, it's somewhere mid-potent. Here are some of the side effects of the misuse of topical steroids. You, do you know that these beauty creams that make you look, uh, look uh, paler or, or like, you know, they, they bleach the skin, contain a lot of clobetasol? Do you know that? Most of the beauticians, you know, they, they take these little fancy uh, cups, uh, which might, you know, the, the, the 
the, or the canisters and you mix a lot of clobidazole, a bit of perfume and a bit of maybe aqueous cream and there you got your, your bleaching cream because if you apply that on a place like the face, the skin depigments and can go on and on. Why? Because steroids can cause staining of the skin. So some as like, if, like uh, that has happened in this man. Then it leads to erythema and the skin can become so transparent that, you can, that there comes a stage where you see the, the blood vessels inside and sometimes it can be quite irre irreversible. So you must be very careful when you use whitening products because they contain a lot of clopidosol. And another side effect of using steroids on the face is acne. Once you use your beauty cream, uh, you become fairer but then after one point you can't stop simply. If you stop, you will get the acne. It's like, um, it's non-stop. All right, now I've been talking a lot. I hope, you're, are you tired? Can you go on for another 15 minutes or so? Yes. I'm going to change topics now. So, uh, this was a 40-year-old woman uh, coming from Pallepola in Martale with this little nodule that has been there for probably six months. But she didn't take much notice because it was not painful, not itchy, it didn't bother her too much. And sometimes people from the Pallepola area for that matter, or Naula, these are the pockets that I know, they can present with ulcers like this. Non-healing ulcers that can go on for a long time. And this lesion is on the neck. Somebody could think of a, a, a BCC or a squamous cell carcinoma. Even when you look at that lesion, for it has been slowly growing and been there for, for quite a while, for months and months. So what is this condition? All of us in Mathura should know this. That's cutaneous leishmaniasis. So what is cutaneous leishmaniasis? It's a parasitic disease uh, that's spread by uh, the phlebotomous sand fly. We call it the valley master. Some people mistakenly call it a valley mecca, which is not exactly that, but it's a very small infect, very flimsy, and if you just, you know, just rub it off, it just um, becomes powder. So that's a comparison, that's the mosquito on your right side and the sandfly on your left side. So what does the sandfly do? It only works as the vector for an intracellular parasite known as Leishmania donovani. So it's the Leishmania donovani that causes uh, the uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis when an infected sandfly bites a person especially on the exposed sites of the body then uh, the, at the bite site the leishmania donovani parasite can give rise to these asymptom asymptomatic nodules uh, that may become ulcers there are different forms um, described so and uh, we suspect that this may be a zoonosis but nobody knows who the reservoir host is it's suspected that dogs and other mammals, even cows, can act as uh, reservoir hosts. Why am I talking about cutaneous leishmaniasis? This is becoming uh, a big problem in Sri Lanka. Because these are some of the epidemiological data. You would notice the, uh, the annual incidence of leishmaniasis cases are shown. It has catapulted since 2016. And we have no data for 2021 yet because of COVID and other reasons. But uh, it was clearly shown that the number of uh, acute tennis leishmaniasis cases seen in uh, uh, Sri Lanka had doubled from 2018 to 2019. So why should we worry about this? Because the same uh, uh, leishmania donovani that causes just the cutaneous lesions in our country, mind you, causes systemic uh, leishmaniasis in India. So there's a very subtle difference between the two and we don't know why we don't get visceral, visceral leishmaniasis in our country but in the recent uh, but in the near future we might start seeing cases so take a look at Madale in 2010 it was in the pink region whereas uh, Anuradhapura and Polonnaru were the ones the north central province districts were the ones that actually had the problem but now in the bordering areas Madale borders Polonnaru mind you so, and uh, a certain part of Anuradhapura as well. So by 2012, it has become darker pink in color. The incidence is increasing. We are seeing so many cases in our clinics nowadays. So uh, this might become a huge problem. So how do we diagnose this? It's basically a clinical diagnosis, but we also do sleep smears. And then 
intralesional and or intramuscular stibogluconate and cryotherapy are some of the um, treatment modalities. So how do you prevent this? Honestly, we don't know how to prevent this because there is very little work going into the entomology site. I mean, we, we think of a sand fly, but I personally suspect there might be other vectors, not just the sand fly. So uh, we are trying to um, stimulate the entomology team to look into this. So where do you find these sand flies is the important question. They are found in all our houses. They like dark, um, humid places and they stick on to, they are uh, described as sticking on to uh, rough walls, but recently they have been located from very smooth walls as well and they like to live inside the house. They are active mostly during um, the, uh, the cool hours of the evening, not so much in the morning. So if you go bare-bodied outside, then the, uh, the uh, uh, vector, the sand flies could bite you and you could get the disease. So how does it spread? Does it spread from one person to another? We are not sure about this, but we often ask the patients to cover the lesion so as not to infect um, further sand flies and hence other uh, things, other humans. So that was a large patch from uh, our ward and after treatment it uh, responds nicely. It can cause disfigurement and you know uh, scarring on the face. Yep. And this is a picture that I love. These are twins from my clinic who <laughs> had lesions in a similar location as well. I don't know how this is possible but that was really something I remember. Okay, I can see your hungry faces, so I'm not going to talk a lot more. But this is a potential future case that I'm going to talk about. You should be aware if somebody like this comes to you, a person who has been uh, having a fever, probably high grade, with malaise, and probably some um, uh, upper respiratory tract infections, and then coming with this, uh, with this rash and lymph nodes, in different sides of the body. Pustules can be large, they can be on the palms, they can be on the body, on the face, anywhere. It could be a single lesion, it could be multiple. What do you think this could be? <laughs> I'm asking you to predict because we still haven't detected this yet. It's got something to do with monkeys, basically. <laughs> yeah, this is monkeypox. Well, in Sri Lanka it has not been reported thus far but um, in India yes there are lots of cases and lots of sporadic cases all over the world it is said to have originated from uh, Africa uh, where it's very similar to smallpox uh, when we were small I think we were vaccinated for smallpox but people born after us were probably not so the smallpox vaccine uh, you know it, it, it's effective for this as well and um, the WHO has actually recommended a, a similar um, vaccine. Uh, this is the, the good thing is that this is considered a self-limiting disease. It's caused by a pox virus, an orthopox virus to be honest. So the incubation period is about two to three weeks and the symptoms can last up to four weeks, but after that it should go down. And in the recent times, it's really funny because it's usually people with homosexuality or sexual contact that uh, have been shown to get this disease specifically but it can spread through droplets, skin secretions and close contact with infected people even close contact with the bedding of a person so this is something you should be aware so during the I have lost record of time I don't know how, how long I talked uh, we went through several things and um, we talked about common dermatological problems and you know the uh, basic management and uh, there's always the dermatology team to, to help or to get an opinion from. So I would also like to give the message that you should think twice before prescribing a topical steroid. So I hope some of this information at least will help you save your skin, particularly in your practice. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Um, and now I think comes the biggest part. Were you given anything to write your name? So like the moment you've been waiting for. I think I'll have to check on them.
I, I think you're supposed to fill in something and they're going to do a raffle draw right here and they will probably announce the names. Just give me two ticks before I...